Welcome everybody to our last professionalization workshop of the semester. It's good to see we have a good audience here today and a wonderful panel on graduate school. So thank you for all being here. Just to give you a sense of everyone on how the panel is gonna run today, I'm gonna to go ahead and moderate our discussion with our four panelists for about 35, 40 minutes, but we have reserved the last 20 minutes or so for questions from the students. Um, we uh, took a survey of all 395 students early on in the semester, you may remember, and one of, the, um, one of the things that popped up quite a bit in terms of interest was a graduate school panel. So we are, uh, we're putting, we put forth a great panel today, some faculty, some TAs, but please take advantage of our Q&A section at the end to ask questions that you have, because I think this is a really neat opportunity to hear both the faculty perspective as well as the graduate student perspective for those of you that are thinking that graduate student or graduate work is is in your future. So before we do some introductions here, let me um, make a few announcements for the class. And I'm sure you're all well aware that the semester is winding down. I can see sort of these red bulging eyes, which tells me that we're in week 13 or 14 of the semester. So uh, in terms of traditional 395 students, and my DC Dornsive students, I've seen a number of them uh, that have uh, popped in today. Know that your final papers uh, and your second political events are due Friday, April 30th, which sounds like a long time from now, but it's actually two weeks from tomorrow by 5 p.m. And that is PST for my DC students. Just be aware of that uh, time change there. Supervisor evals went out for traditional and 395 or Dornsife. DC Dornsai 395 students, uh, you may wanna check with your supervisor to make sure that they received it. Sometimes <clears throat> those emails go into spam and it is important that we get those supervisors evals back in a timely fashion so that we can get the, the class put to bed once everyone's finals, final papers are in. And let's see, what else? Oh, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings, and this actually applies to traditional DC Dornsai and uh, 395 research uh, students. I put out our uh, my one-on-one -on -one student or my one-on-one -on -one, um, opportunities class listings for uh, starting next week, starting a week from Friday. So there are 60 slots. I'm going to meet with each and every one of you over three days. Uh, really, the purpose of the one-on-one -on -one is just to touch base with you, see if you have any questions about your final papers, see if any assignments are missing, and um, to uh, just so you sort of know where you're in at the class as the class is starting to round out. So please grab one of those slots and they're quick meetings. They're all of 10 minutes long. There should be plenty of spots for everybody. So please, please, please take care of that ASAP. All right, with no further ado, I'm gonna to turn to our panel and I'm really excited to not only have someone from my department, but also, uh, you know, a, pro a professor and a graduate student from uh, Price as well. So from the Department of Political Science and International Relations, we have Dr. Christian Gross. Christian, how long have you been in the department now? I was trying to figure at least. This is 10 years. Well, 10 like years, 10 I figured years. eight to 10, yeah. somewhere around there. That's amazing. He's an associate professor of political science. He has a joint appointment in public policy at Seoul Price. He's the academic director of the USC Schwarzenegger Institute. So obviously uh, Christian keeps himself busy. He is a prolific author, uh, authoring more than 30 articles, chapters, uh, books in American politics, public policy, legislative politics. If you get the chance to take a class with Christian, I highly recommend it. He is a wealth of knowledge and a wonderful colleague. From Seoul Price, we have Dr. Juliet Musso, Associate Professor of Public Policy and Management, and also the Vice Dean for Academic Programs at Seoul Price School of Public Policy. So Juliet, you keep very busy, as I can tell. Uh, you work in the fields of state and local. State. The Say again. Oh, I thought I heard something, sorry. Uh, you work in the area of state and local governance, federalism, urban political economy, uh, state and local institutional reform, actually quite a list here. So you have a, uh, obviously a deep breath in that area and we really thank you for coming and being part of our 
panel today. Our first graduate student is Raquel Centeno. Raquel is one of my TAs in Poli Sci 130 now. So I'm gonna put her in the awkward position later on to ask her about her experience. Uh, maybe not necessarily in my class, but you're welcome to uh, say as you will. She's got a, B, a BA in political science with an emphasis in international relations from Cal Lutheran and began the doctor program here in the Department of Political Science and International Relations in 2019. And she is focusing her work on political psychology, partisan polarization, and research methods. And last but certainly not least, Tai Lee, who has a master's in public policy from USC, has a BA in International Development Studies and Asian American Studies from another school across the way. I'll give you a hint, it's powder blue. We won't judge. Um, his research interests are in immigration, immigrant Im um, integration, naturalization, social equity, social justice, community development. My gosh, the list goes on and on. So I wanna thank Ty for being here today. I thought we would start out, um, Juliet, if it's all right with you. Um, I always like to promote programs, both uh, in Sol Price and in Dornsife. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of the graduate school offerings at Sol Price, and then uh, we'll do the same for Christian in just a second. Sure, great, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and it's nice to see everyone. Um, uh, congratulations on surviving this lockdown year. Um, so as, as uh, Professor Auerbach said, I am the Vice Dean for Academic Programs at the Price School. So I oversee all of our programs actually. And I'll talk mostly about the, our master's programs and then I can say a couple of words about our PhD program. Um, we have five core master's programs that um, four of which recruit students directly out of undergraduate. One is more of a kind of uh, more executive in its focus. So the program that I think lots of students with a background in public uh, political science will come to is either our Masters of Public Policy, um, which Ty has, um, or our Masters of Public Administration. So those are both two-year programs. Um, we actually, as many of you may know, we also have a progressive degree program in each of those where you can essentially do your program, your undergraduate degree, and then the master's program in five-ish years. So um, you can cross count some of your undergraduate credits towards the master's degree. So um, I also have to say, I, I have, my undergraduate degree is actually in psychology from another UC one that has a banana slug as its, mod, as its mascot. So- um, that's, all, that's all right, I'm a gaucho, so, you know. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm a slug. So um, <laughs> I actually, after I got my um, bachelor's in psychology, went and worked as a consultant doing cons um, essentially program evaluation for a couple of years. And then I ended up going to get my master's of public policy from um, a competitor up north. And so, um, so I have both a master's Masters of Public Policy and a PhD in Public Policy. So I went the path that Ty is going with both the master's, professional master's degree and then the interdisciplinary PhD. Um, when, with my Masters of Public Policy, I worked for the California State Legislature for four years for the Legislative Analyst's Office before going back to get my PhD. And so the Masters of Public Policy, which I have in Ty, is a more analytic applied degree in government. And usually the difference between the MPP and the MPA is that they both prepare students to go work in public agencies or public, the public or nonprofit sector. The Masters of Public Policy typically has a lot more quantitative content. So our MPP um, has, I think about three or four econ and stats courses compared to the MPA, which is really has econ and then one quant course. So it's a sort of more analytically sophisticated, more analytically focused degree. The other difference between the MPP and the MPA is really a historic one that the Masters of Public Administration really developed as a subfield of political science initially in the early part of the 20th century and kind of emerged as a field in sort of the middle of the century that was focused very much on um, this idea that politics and administration were completely separate and that 
folks would get the masters of public administration and then go work as sort of neutral parties in government. That was the sort of idea of the MPA. The MPP emerged out of really the post-World War II era when there was a kind of, and, and the post-Great Society era of the 1960s, where there was an acknowledgement that perhaps thinking, okay, we're just going to leave the political process to politicians, and then we're going to send neutrally competent government officials in that are trained in public administration to carry out what politicians, you know, kind of the acts of, of political officials, that maybe there was some argument for infusing reason and evidence and by sort of um, interdisciplinary nonpartisan advice into the political process. And so the schools of public policy that emerged really in the 1970s were efforts to take political science and economics and, and operations research. So kind of math, logic, um, uh, political astuteness, and then economic efficiency reasoning and try to bring those into the political process to provide expert advice in the process of making public de political decisions or public decisions as opposed to kind of waiting until political decisions were made and then kind of neutrally kind of carrying them out. So the history of public policy tends to be more focused towards political advocacy and political um, kind of in, you know the political process and I think often more kind of institutional reform focus as opposed to public administration which tends to be more focused on management within systems. Now that said so the MPA is kind of more like we're going to go manage organizations this is a little stereotypical the MPP is more like we're going to go change systems. That's and, and that may be a little bit of an overstatement because I think you will see people with either an MPA or an MPP going to work in either kind of setting. We see MPAs who work in political advocacy, who work as staff to people in the legislature and all sorts of different kinds of jobs that you might think of as being very political. And similarly, we see MPPs, who you think of being kind of more of a political job, going to work as managers, going to work as leaders within organizations. And so um, I think that, that the kind of distinction between the two is largely, is kind of more, a, 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 it's almost more a result of history and the historical mm -hmm. development of the two degrees than it is like really a profound difference between the two. Great, great, um, great overview. Wow, I had no idea the sort of the history and the, the way they've sort of evolved. Christian, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, about our program up in POIR and, and um, yeah, give us sort of a sense of, of what it's like. Yeah, so thanks, thanks. Um, <clears throat> and Julia, yeah, that was fun. I actually really enjoyed hearing the, the, uh, the, that background on public policy and public administration too. Um, yeah, so I, I'm in the political science and international relations department as my primary appointment. I was the director of the PhD program for three years. Uh, from 2015 to 2018. So um, just as an overview of our department in terms of the PhD program. Um, and then I could talk a little bit about PhD programs in general in the social yeah. sciences and political science in particular. That'd be good. Um, yeah, so our program is, um, is one that basically tries to train people as researchers. Um, the idea is that you would study one of generally four fields that are currently in the department, American politics, comparative politics, international relations, research methods. Um, there's a proposal to include gender, race, ethnicity, and politics pending to add as an additional field that is actually a field in the discipline. Um, it's not at every single department, and so that could be something that'd be coming soon. But typically, the organization of political science is into the, these specific fields, and you choose something that you emphasize. Um, uh, and for me, for example, I'm, I'm a specialist in American politics. And then I also do dabble some in public policy and institutional design on the side too. Um, <clears throat> but um, in terms of what we look for, like who are the kind of people that maybe go to get a master's in public policy or an MPA versus somebody that maybe gets a PhD in political science, right? Or a PhD in another field in the social sciences. A PhD has got to be for something you really want to become a researcher, even if your ultimate goal at the end of graduation may not be academia, 
but you really need to believe in wanting to write a dissertation on something that you're passionate about, become the expert on something in the field, right? And so it's, um, it's beyond just getting trained and learning how to do methods and learning how to do research, but really deciding that you're going to effectively write something that's, you know, potentially a book or a series of articles where you will become known as that, you know, like the person who knows about that. And it could be something really narrow. It often is something very narrow, but it asks, it answers really big questions, right? So, um, uh, and, and, and I think that's the way it is generally in, in other departments too, but I do think different departments have different emphases, right? So some places, um, uh, almost all political science departments in the United States have um, American politics, comparative politics and international relations as fields. Almost all of them have research methods as fields, um, some of them separate quantitative methods from qualitative methods. Some of them combine them into one. Um, some of them emphasize quantitative methods more than, than qualitative methods. And I would say probably um, in the study of political science, quantitative methods is, is generally dominant in the area of American politics. Um, and it's a little bit more mixed between quantitative and qualitative and, and the other fields in political science. Um, and I'm happy to define what those things mean too as we get going as well. But in terms of like, what does our program do? What does a PhD look like? Um, you, you enter, you take a lot of coursework just like you would be right now, but the coursework is going to be really, really heavy on the reading and you're going to start thinking about your own ideas in the coursework. You're going to learn like, what is the field of political science and what's missing and what will you do next? Um, and that goes on for about two years. Then you take something called a qualifying exam. Um, qualifying exam is to demonstrate your knowledge of the field. You pass it or you fail it. Um, you also have to write a paper in our program as part of that process. That's an original research paper that may serve as the baseline for your dissertation. Um, and then you eventually advance to candidacy, meaning that you select a dissertation committee and you write a proposal of what you want to do and what you want to research. And then you will spend probably two years, three years writing your dissertation, which is like a book that is not quite a book. That's that's perhaps the best way to describe it if you're new to um, to graduate school. And then you and then you finish. Um, and then in terms of what do you do after that? Traditionally, um, our graduates as well as graduates of most other programs have gotten jobs in academia. Um, the academic job market I think is changing for a lot of different reasons. And so I think there's also opportunities outside of academia for research. There's just before this call today, I was on a call with um, some policy practitioners who are hiring. A research director and they want to know if we had any PhDs interested in moving into the policy world and so there's an opportunity to do that but you if there's a research focus or you traditionally go in academia. Great great overview Christian. Um, Ty let me bring you into the conversation and ask you um, I wonder what your thought process was when you were starting to contemplate graduate school what sort of factors did you consider and ultimately what, what pushed you to pursue the path you did? Yeah, definitely. So I actually took a, I actually had a minor in my undergraduate career um, at UCLA. Um, and so for a long time, I wanted to be, you know, as a young person, I wanted to be ideally a UN ambassador. So I always studied international development studies, minored in political science, but I realized maybe, you know, that's not necessarily the route for me. So after uh, graduating from undergrad, I actually, uh, went abroad for about six years uh, and did work abroad. So I, I was in Korea for a couple of years doing uh, teaching English as well as youth development. I was in Vietnam and then I was in Indo Indonesia for a few years doing the Peace Corps. Uh, during my time during the Peace Corps in particular, I was thinking about what is it that I really wanted to do. Um, and as um, Dr. Musso said earlier, you know, a lot of folks who go into the MPP program, they really want to change the world. And that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to do more systematic changes. Um, so instead of just helping communities hands-on, I wanted to be able to contribute to creating policy changes that would create more institutional changes. Um, so I applied to different MPP programs, uh, got into a few, decided to go to USC, which is closer to home. Um, and while I was doing the MPP program, I learned a lot of uh, important and great skills. Um, you know, it's a pretty rigorous program, you know, some stats, some econ. I wasn't really great at that in undergrad, um, but uh, the MPP program made it really easy. Um, what During the MPP program, a lot of my peers, they wanted to go into work right away. A lot of them are in 
uh, community-based organizations. Some of them are in local government, state government, federal government, and so on. I was more interested in doing research, particularly research that is accessible to communities, um, because oftentimes what we find in terms of the research that is available is not always accessible, whether it's the language that is being used or just things that are kept in this ivory tower. And so I applied to the PhD program because I wanted to not only create research that would be able to be to bridge academia and activist work, but I wanted to be able to be in the classroom and teach uh, future advocates um, because I didn't really see many people who look like me in the classroom as well. And so I applied for the PhD program. I'm doing the PhD program right now. I'm actually in the dissertation phase, um, doing a lot of work on uh, social equity, social justice. So though my dissertation is looking at how barriers to gaining citizenship is particularly gendered and racialized, I do a lot of work on the digital divide as well. Um, I do mixed methods, so not only quantitative work, but I do um, you know, community-based ethnographic work as well. And next year I'll be doing a postdoc where I'll be doing, I'll be teaching, doing research, but also community organizing. And right. so again, as Where, uh, where's Dr. the postdoc gonna be at? Uh, is at the Equity Research Institute with uh, uh, Dr. Pastor. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful, fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Raquel, I wonder if you could give us a sense of your path and what your thought process was. And maybe when did you realize that you were gonna you know, undertake this pretty significant commitment. I know for myself, it took me seven years to finish my doctorate, I think, which was one year quicker than my uh, dissertation chair, Howard Gilman, who's the uh, president at UC Irvine. So I figured I got one thing on him anyway. Um, tell us about it, Raquel. Yeah, so um, when I was an undergrad, I, made, I wasn't sure really what I wanted to do at the end of college. I knew I was kind of interested in politics. I knew I was interested in doing something that had like a real world impact, but I wasn't quite sure what that looked like. And so I got really into like environmentalism and international relations and like sustainable development in undergrad. And that was something I kind of focused a lot of class projects on for a really long time. And I kind of thought, okay, this is, can be what I do. I, maybe I work in policy. Maybe I work on some sort of like supply chain kind of, you know, sustainable sourcing for a company like a Patagonia. Um, but kind of when I got to the end of undergrad, I was feeling a little burnt out, I think, on focusing so heavily on that one topic. And I did a capstone because in our particular department, you had to, because it was like a liberal arts college, uh, you had to do kind of a capstone research project. And so it needed to be something that was actually like doable for an undergrad with no money and like, you know, <laughs> staying on campus. So I actually focused on um, how, so in the UC and Cal State system, in order to be eligible to apply to these colleges, you have to do the set of policies called the A through G requirements as a high school student. So anyone from California knows about the A through G requirements from high school, taking certain English classes, math classes. And what I was really interested in seeing was whether this, the, the implementation of this policy led to any changes in college readiness for students over time. And I really enjoyed kind of doing that project because it allowed me to do a lot of kind of ethnographic interviewing. Um, I got to talk to both people who were impacted by the policies as students, but also um, like educators as practitioners. And I really enjoyed the process of talking to people, kind of looking for trends and stuff. And I realized that I actually really like the process of research itself. And so um, with some encouragement from my undergraduate advisor, I started thinking about grad school and in particular PhD programs. But at the end of school, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to make the huge commitment of doing a PhD program for a long time, um, you know, going kind of wherever I got accepted. And so I wanted to take some time off from school to make sure that I wasn't just jumping into graduate school without like really thinking about it. So I ended up taking a year off from undergrad and I worked as a substitute teacher actually. Um, so I worked with kids from uh, transitional kindergarten up through 12th grade. And what I learned from doing that along with a bunch of other internships and in undergrad was that I liked the idea of doing research in an academic setting. And so for me, that kind of set in stone that I wanted to apply to PhD programs. And so when I was looking for places to apply to, um, I thought about things like location because when you're in graduate school, you're gonna be there for a while. And so I wanted it to be somewhere that I could actually enjoy being long-term. And then I also looked for like um, how good of a fit it would be for my interests because um, over time, my interests have kind of developed into how we 
learn about politics as young people, um, what causes some people to become politically engaged and what, what causes some people to become politically like apathetic, kind of what draws people to politics and like the world in general. And the thing is, is while there is, are some people who study that in political science, not everybody does. And that wouldn't necessarily be supported at every university. So I was also very mindful of that. So I put in my applications, it was an expensive process, and we had a long time to hear results. And I ended up uh, getting into a couple schools, one of which was USC. And you know, um, I felt like I would be pretty well supported here. And I felt like it was the right time to do it. So I ended up coming to USC and joining the POIR program. Great, thank you. Yeah. Wonderful, it's interesting to hear the, the interesting different threads between the two of you um, and similarities and differences. Juliet, you did touch on uh, a little bit of, you know, non-academic careers for people with like an MPP or an MPA. I wonder if you could talk about why someone chooses to go for a master's as opposed to a PhD. Is that really a stark line in the sand or is it something where you could start a master's and then figure, no, you know, I'm really enjoying this. I want to continue on to a doctorate degree or is it, do you need to know you're going to go for the doctorate from the get-go? That's a great question. Um, so the master's degrees, like the MPP or the MPA or, you know, planning these sort of public affairs master's degrees, they're considered to be a terminal degree in the sense that once you get that degree, there's not an expectation that you would go on to get a PhD. And they typically are focused on public, you know, essentially sort of public sector work. They're, you know, and so they really are great just to give you a lot of flexibility about the kind of job you might have. It could be in the public sector, in consulting. So there are lots and lots of people who get an MPP and can go work in a consulting firm, for example. Um, that if you get, the, we do actually, you know, we have this PhD in um, public policy and also PhD in urban planning and development that we, I haven't talked about, but there are these interdisciplinary applied PhD programs. I, I also have the PhD in public policy. And so I think a lot of people who have the MPP will end up going to get the PhD in that field because that two years of MPP experience is considered to be you know, kind of a leg up. You don't have to take as many units to get the PhD if you have the master's degree. Um, and so that is an option if you decide to do the professional master's degree and then you feel like, oh, I really love doing research, I want to teach, then you can go on and do what Ty did, which, or what I did, which is to go get the PhD in public policy. I actually have two pals from Berkeley from way back who also teach in public policy schools who got their MPP at Berkeley and then decided to go get their political science PhD instead. And they are both, um, one of them is at the Evans School, which is the University of Washington's um, MPP program. And the other one is at University of Virginia. So they've actually had very similar careers to mine, even though they decided to go get the political science degree and I got the, the PhD in public policy. So you can go in either, in either direction. Um, I, I think the most important thing to stress is the point that um, Dr. Gross made, which is the reason to, and, and I think also you could see it in Raquel and Ty as they talked about this, the reason to get a PhD is because you love doing research. Because you are going to do a lot of research and you're going to have a really long substantial research project that's going to take you two or three years. And if you don't love doing that, you're going to be miserable. So, you know, you shouldn't go to get a PhD thinking that it's like something that you need to do in order to be successful. Um, whereas the master's degree, like a professional master's degree prepares you to work in government, consulting, community-based organizations, the like, and it's more action focused as opposed to research focused typically. Right. I think that would be the distinction. That's great. Christian, I wonder if you could weigh in You've certainly talked about, you know, the academic path for people with their PhDs in, in political science, but I would also imagine that some of your, maybe not your former students, or maybe your former students, or people that come out with their, their PhDs in political science might not necessarily go in academia. Are there other alternatives, or do you really think that's the main, the main uh, 
incentive for, for getting that PhD in, in poli sci? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's a mix. I mean, I do think that his, historically the primary job outcome of a PhD has been um, being on the faculty at a university. Um, but I do think there's some there's some emerging trends where there are other options and there's other there are also historically people who have taken different routes. So, um, you know, the, the option one would be um, a position on the faculty at a university. Right. And it's a, it's a very particular way of how the job market works and it's on an academic schedule. And unlike the real world, you don't apply for jobs and they ask you to start a month later after you get the, the offer. They ask you to start seven months later yeah, exactly. when the academic year begins and um so the, there's that but then on, in terms of non-academic routes there's there's a few right and so some people I, i've had i've had a couple students like this who received the phd who decided they really did enjoy the research but they wanted to do something else right and so they ended up going into the private sector um and they didn't necessarily need the phd to do that but they did get some value added out of it for themselves um but um and so there's that that's kind of what i would call option two you pursued the PhD, you went to the private sector, you perhaps could have done those private sector jobs with an MA um, or an MPP um, and, and so on. And then there's there's a sort of a special set of jobs I'd say that do actually require a PhD but are in research outside of academia. There are not a lot of them. I think more of them are starting to come out, um, but this is where you would perhaps work, um, work as somebody who is, uh, um, is like positions would be research director, policy director, the kind of people who are giving sort of high level top line um, uh, analyses. You have to understand how to do the research in a very serious way so that you can speak to academics and other researchers who are serious. But there's um, there are some some examples of this. Right. And so, you know, you can see this also um, similarly, maybe working at a foundation. Right. So we're instead of doing the research yourself, you may be evaluating research that other people are doing and diverting um, diverting resources to help support that research. So those are other non-academic options in that in that broader realm. Um, I do also occasionally see, um, you know, the, there's a, a specific data science component if you have a, a very quantitative background. Um, though this also would apply to qualitative work too, because sometimes there's there's people looking for qualitative researchers in the private sector. But a lot of tech companies have had an interest in hiring people who are PhDs and on the academic side to do research within their companies, right? Like a Facebook or Google, um, places like that. And the PhD would be needed. Um, however, I wanna caution everyone that like, I, I do think even though there's an emerging sort of set of options of a PhD, there, the the options are actually really hard to get. <laughs> so even whether it's working for Google as a data scientist or working on the tenure track at the University of Southern California, right? So there, and I don't want to say this to be discouraging. I want to say this to be realistic. When you, if you do pursue a PhD, think about what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. You will do real. You will. It'll be amazing to have a PhD. There is like there. Like I'm from a background in which that is not something people in my family had. So that by itself is a value and a thing to have. But if you're going to get a PhD because you want to be a data scientist at Google with a, or you want to be the research director at the Brookings Institution, good, do it. But also be realistic that that might not happen. <laughs> and I, so just that you've got to keep your options open. And um, and just in my own experience to talk about that. So I, you know, I was pretty interested in an academic job when I was coming out of graduate school. And so I applied everywhere. I, I ended up taking a job that was excellent. I'm very lucky to get the job um, in somewhere that I didn't really want to live. And to be honest, at a school that I wasn't that excited about. <laughs> um, and so sometimes you have to make compromises and you have to decide, is this something you really want to do? Do you really want to be a researcher? Um, and if you do, you have to make the compromises. And then if you're lucky, you don't have to make the compromises eventually. And maybe you get to work somewhere that you actually really want to be in a place that you want to be. Yeah, you make a you make a really good point, which I think is unusual. You know, you come out of law school, and there's law jobs everywhere, right? And you know, when you graduate with a PhD and there's a job opening at University of Iowa, you're gonna go live in Iowa, right? And and I'm not knocking on Iowa. I'm sure it's a lovely state, but it's not Great California, job, right? Yeah. right? You know, so you got to go where the job is, and um, and I think that's sort of important to keep in mind. So Brandon, or, or Will, pardon me, I'll get to you one sec when we start answering questions. I just have a couple more questions for our two graduate students and then we'll transition to, um, 
to our Q&A. So Raquel, I wonder if you could just talk for a minute or two about your transition from undergrad to graduate. Because that's a big step. Like one minute you're attending classes and you're taking notes and you're participating. And the next minute you're leading classes and you hopefully have been given some training. But yeah, you know, my experience was I had like, you know, very limited training and I was sort of thrown into the classroom. So what was that experience like for you? Yeah, um, I think I had the great fortune undergrad of having a um, good faculty advisor who was very realistic with me about grad school. And she said, you know what? I know that you are academically ready. Like you can totally handle it, but that's not the hard part of graduate school. The hard part of graduate school is the emotional side. It's all of the rejections you'll get from time to time. It's having to work really hard. It's, you know, the massive amount of workload that's involved. And, you know, it's really hard and um, you just have to be prepared for that. And I definitely was to a degree. Like, you know, I had people tell me it was going to be tough. And then I got to graduate school and I realized, you know what, like it is hard, but you can't really understand how hard it is until you're actually doing it. And so I would say the first like semester for sure for me of graduate school was very much like a learning curve. Um, you know, I, when I was an undergrad, we definitely did some academic readings, but they weren't maybe as like theoretically intensive as some of the stuff that I had to read in graduate school. Um, there was a lot of reading, like for one class, we would read at least like a book a week. And it was like hard, like, you know, political theory kinds of works. And that was not the kind of thing I did in my undergraduate education. And so I had to learn how to read quickly. I had to learn how to kind of accept that you can't do some things as well as you would like to, and that's totally okay because you can just do the next thing next week. Um, and that was definitely something I had to kind of learn to cope with as an undergraduate student who did pretty well at that level. And I think when you know you throw Tiang into the mix, I was lucky in that I had a little bit of experience in running a classroom and that I was a substitute teacher for a while. And so I was kind of like, okay, if I can wrangle like second graders and get everybody to stay in their chairs, like we can do college kids. And I think that, you know, That's I had probably the, true. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's yeah, it's 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 uh, definitely its own set of skills. And so um, I think for me, the really intimidating part was everybody, all these students are paying to be here. You know, they kind of want to really learn in, um, in depth about a subject. And I wanna make sure that I do my best to kind of deliver that information in an effective way. And at first, I think I kind of had to learn, you know, what helps students the most? Like, is it more about lectures? Is it more about participatory activities? Um, and then over time, I kind of tried to find a balance there. I think a couple of my students are actually here in this class. So hopefully they agree that I found a balance at this point. But yeah, I would say it's kind of a lot of just trial and error in graduate school, especially in the first couple of years. Great. Uh, Ty, I wonder if you could comment a little bit, you know, when you're in undergrad, <clears throat> It's a very collaborative world you live in. And I think probably Juliet and Christian would agree. There are times when you're, as well as yourself and Raquel, there are times when you're a graduate student that you're on an island amongst yourself. I mean, you're doing your work, you're putting your head down, you're crunching the numbers, you're, you're, you're creating your data set. Um, do you see a sort of collaborative environment uh, in, sort of your world that you're that you're currently in in terms of graduate work yeah definitely i think i've been very fortunate because price really offers a, a great space to collaborate with a lot of different folks because it's such an interdisciplinary department uh, we get to meet faculty as well as other phd students from different walks of life as well as a lot of uh, practitioners and community organizers that we get to meet and collaborate with so I, I think my experience working as a PhD student doing research is perhaps not of the norm just because, um, again, price allows us to really collaborate, but I've been very proactive in reaching out to people and have a really great cohort of folks who also like working together. So I've been on different projects, writing papers with uh, people from with different specialties, as well as different kind of uh, methodological approaches. So for me, being in public policy, I tackle a lot of policy issues from a sociological standpoint. And so I work with a lot of faculty members from the sociology department, as well as um, a lot of students from there as well. And so I would say I do have my own work when I do work on my own. But at the same time, I 
and collaborating with other folks on different projects. So I'm not always alone because I could always confide in um, either the faculty or other students on the work that I'm doing and get feedback on that. Great, wonderful. Um, I will mention that within, at least what I'm familiar with in POIR, when, when students come in, they come in in a cohort and that cohort helps create uh, a, 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 a level of community, I would think, where Kel is probably right, right? You have, our cohorts were larger. I, I don't know how bad, big the current cohorts are. I think they're 10 or 12 students. Um, I know when I came in, we were, I was number third, lucky number 13. I think I was literally the last person in my cohort, and yet I'm still here. All right, so we have about 15, 16 minutes uh, left in the hour, and I do want to devote that time to the students. Will, I, I know you had your hand up earlier, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll just go down the line, and if you want to direct it either to um, either of the faculty or to the students, please do. So, Will, why don't you kick us off? Great. So first off, thank you so much to the panelists. You guys have been amazing. Hearing your stories have been uh, fantastic, uh, especially uh, Lee. I really resonate with your the aspiration of wanting to change the world. And that's why I wanted to come to DC. That's why I want to study uh, political science. So that's, that's an amazing anecdote. Um, being in DC and interning on the Hill, uh, I've gotten to work on legislative issues with FEMA, transportation, energy, and foreign affairs. And with that, uh, I've been able to ask my staff uh, what they would recommend, MPP or uh, JD. And almost unanimously, they all say I should get a, a JD, even though I've been planning to get an MPP really since I got into SC. So what is your take on that? And I want to hear from both the panelists and Professor Auerbach, since I know you got a JD, I, I would like to hear from you as well, if that's OK. Sure. Yeah, definitely. So. It Ultimately, it really depends on what particular niche within the field that you want to go into. So I know a lot of folks who work on the Hill who have MPPs and they do more of the background work and there's more related to the data and the uh, analytics. And I know folks who have a JD and their specialty is about the law. But I believe USC also offers an MPP JD program that you can definitely look into. Um, and I believe price makes it very easy for those folks who are pursuing dual deg degrees to do it in a way that fits your time, but also fits your own particular needs. And I think a lot of people who do do that really find a lot of value in it because what the law school offers a of price can also supplement. So price has a lot of really great faculty members that you can talk to, including a lot of folks who uh, worked on the Hill. I, there's one uh, adjunct instructor right now who worked for Obama in the EPA, um, pretty high up, and as a, one of the communications folks. And he teaches about what is the best way to frame policy and communicate policy. And that's something that wasn't really offered at uh, the law school. So there were a couple of law students in that course as well. Uh, Juliet, any thoughts on on joint degrees? Yeah, I, I think actually, you know, and and not to, it is true that we have a joint law and public policy degree, and I think a lot of programs do. I actually applied to one MPP program and five or six JD programs, thinking that I wanted to go into law, and then I went to the MPP at re reception for admitted students, and I was like, these are my people. And I never look back. I actually have a number of friends who are lawyers and they're very jealous of my career because it's more mm -hmm. interesting than the typical law degree, law career. So I think if you go into law and then you do public sector law or you go work in politics with a law degree, then it's very similar kind of work. But a lot of people who go into law end up going into corporate. And I think that my corporate law friends, they're jealous of, the, of my job, I have to say. <laughs> That's great. Christian, any thoughts Imagine. on the, the dual degree or, or the value of JDs versus PhDs? Yeah, I, I concur with uh, Dr. Merced that um, I, I had a very good friend from college who she was doing extremely well in corporate law. Um, and I, I, I envied her salary, I think. Um, but she was <laughs> like, I got to get off of this track. How do I do what you're doing? <laughs> and that was, um, so sometimes you just have to go into a field and decide if it's the one you want. Like you may not know that at your age. And if you want to change the world, maybe go get a law degree or an MPP. And if it's not for you, change careers. That's okay, right? I mean, yeah, maybe not when you're 
Yeah, when you're 65, maybe it's too late to change careers. But like, you know, you're young. You can go do something you think is right. And if it's not right, try the next thing, right? Um, yeah. So don't be afraid to pick is, I guess, my advice. Um, and then in terms of like, if you're not sure, law, MPP, MPA, um, I mean, I will make a pitch for the the master's programs. I mean, the master programs at Price and master programs at Public Policy in general, they're good. That's a, That might be a way to get your feet wet and decide, is this the kind of thing I want to do in government? Am I interested in the legal part if you're unsure? Yeah, and I, to be honest, I'm exhibit A. Um, I practiced law, got my law degree in 1990, practiced for 10 years. I was in my mid thirties. Um, and I had done what I, you know, people always ask if you liked it so much, why did you leave? Um, I enjoyed what I did. I was an appellate attorney. Um, I just didn't want to do it for another 30 years. That's really what it comes down to. I just didn't get, you know, I worked for the state attorney general. I did good law, but after a while I thought, well, I pretty much had done everything in 10 years as a public sector attorney. So pretty much because my wife let me sort of become a, you know, a, a graduate student at age 33, if you can believe that, with a six month old at home. I was Mr. Mom and I would take care of our daughter during the day and do my classes at night. Um, and, you know, I've been fortunate enough. I had a great career with the AG. I have a great career in academia. Um, I, I enjoy both. And so you can do it, but mine was a little bit more happenstance. I never planned to get the PhD coming out of undergrad. I really didn't. I thought I'll be a lawyer. That'll be my path, blah, blah, blah. I just thought, you know, and after a while you get one life and one crack at life. So if you're not thoroughly satisfied within some limitations of maybe age or where you're living, you know, take that shot when you can and don't be afraid to. So, um, Allison, I see your hand up. Hi, thank you so much for talking to all of us today. I really appreciate you guys taking the time, but, um, Raquel brought up the point about choosing a graduate school based off of location. And I was kind of thinking, if you're going to a law school, would you want to go to a law school in the state that you eventually want to practice in because you're going to probably be taking the bar there and there will probably be more courses available within that state? Like, should that be a factor of your decision or should you like just go to the law school with the best ranking that you get into? Well, I'm certainly happy to comment on that just because I went through that process. But the truth is when you're in law school, you don't learn state law for the most part. You learn federal law. Why? Because there's one federal law, but there's 50 state laws. So um, I tell students, if you plan on like being in Los Angeles, it's perfectly fine to go to an LMU or a Pepperdine or a USC or well, SC and UCLA are, are well-known programs, but smaller programs, um, you know, you're gonna be a known commodity in Los Angeles. Now, if you go to Pepperdine, which was my alma mater, and then you go to school or you go out to get a job in summer back East, they may not be as familiar with Pepperdine. So if you're in a T14, they're gonna know Cornell, whether you're on the East Coast or the West Coast, right? They're gonna know Emory. They're gonna know all the big schools. You know, if, if you're not in that world and there are a lot of people not in that world, um, then you can, you can certainly go to smaller schools if you think, yes, that's the city where I'm gonna practice. But in terms of going to a law school because that's where you wanna live and you're gonna learn about California law, you're not going to. You go to law school to learn to think like a lawyer. The law changes all the time. All you do is jump on the Westlaw and it pops up the law. So they train you to think that's where your value is in how you analyze things. Um, that I think is distinctly different. And, and Christian, maybe you can, chime in on this about selecting graduate programs based on location. Yeah, I think, I think it depends. And so I would, um, um, I think we all do a little bit of that, even if we don't think we do. I mean, when I applied to graduate school from undergraduate, I was living on the East Coast, I was living in North Carolina, and I, apl I applied all over the place to mostly East Coast universities, <laughs> right? Um, and so in my head, I thought I'm only going to go based on the best program with the best fit with faculty who do what I want to do. But realistically, I didn't actually apply that many West Coast universities when I, when I think back about it. Um, and so part of it is you need to be somewhere that you're going to be comfortable enough that you're not going to want to leave if this is what you want to do. But on the other hand, you know, don't be afraid to go somewhere that maybe is better for you because the faculty are a better fit. So I'm thinking about a PhD program here. You might want to get a little bit out of your comfort zone if the faculty are a better fit. Law school, I agree with, you know, I agree with um, Professor Auerbach. Um, you 
you know, you, you want to go to the University of Chicago? Good. That sounds, that, you should probably go to the University of Chicago, right? Because <laughs> that, that'll open a lot of doors for you, even if it's not really, even if you want to work in Los Angeles later, right? Or, or wherever. So that's, um, those are the sort of things you need to think about. Um, and then when you get in, you can evaluate those things, right? So, I mean, when, when you get into, you know, programs, you can say, these two look pretty similar to me on all dimensions, like what's going to help my career? Am I going to be trained the way that I want? Am I going to learn what I want in law or in political science or whatever field? And then you say, you know what? I'd rather be at this really good school in Los Angeles than this really good school in Illinois, <laughs> right? Um, or whatever, right? But, but, then, but then don't rule it out at the front end would be my advice, right? So maybe think about, give yourself that opportunity to apply. And then PhD programs, um, we'll invite you to come and visit during non-COVID times. And so you can also get a sense and you might be surprised where I ended up going to grad school was not where I wanted to go on location at first, um, but I enjoyed the visit and the program was good and it was a good fit for me. So um, so that helped actually to to do that. that so that's kind of, I, I balance a lot of different variables and aim high. Also, don't be afraid to be rejected. I guess that's the last thing I'll say. I always, I always tell undergrads this, they're like, I didn't get into the school. And I'm like, that's fine, right? Like you need to develop a thick skin in any field, apply to places, you will probably get rejected from some and then pick the best one that is for good for you. And don't worry about the rejection, focus on the ones you got accepted to. Yeah, those are, those are great words of advice. So, welcome to the world and real life. You're you're going to get jobs. You're not going to get jobs. You know, it's you're going to get into just like you did with undergrad, by the way. Uh, Morella, you had your hand up. So why don't you go ahead and direct your question to whomever you'd like to. This is kind of a question for all of you guys, but I was curious about the schoolwork and life balance. I know, Professor Auerbach, you were just talking about how you decided to go back to school when you're in your mid 30s and you had a child at home. So I was curious what that balance looks like and how you guys really, I guess, cope with the amount of schoolwork that you have. Who wants to tackle that? Uh, Julia, I, why don't I you start? Why don't I you give it a shot? I start by saying that um, I think that if you, it can be tough to essentially climb the ladder at an R1 university if you want to have a family. Because to, and so, some people write really quickly and maybe it wouldn't be an issue, but if you are, you know, if you want to have a family and you want to spend time with your family, it can be a little bit tough, I think. And um, to be quite honest, and I actually was talking with one of my colleagues about this and I commented that another colleague, this particular senior colleague had said, well, this person just hasn't been making progress towards promotion as quickly as I would like. And I said, well, that person has a kid with special needs at home and maybe that's part of it. And the comment was, that's not an excuse. When I was a junior or like, you know, when my kids were young, they played under my, under my chair while I worked. Now, my response to that is, okay, number one, if you have a kid with special needs, they're not necessarily gonna be able to play under your chair while you work because they need, need extra supports that do take time away from your work. And second of all, is that actually having kids to ignore them while you work and they're just sitting there playing under your chair? And so to be frank, I think it's a challenge. It's, I think it's also particularly a challenge for women in academia who often, I think, you know, there still are, you know, I think glass ceilings in academia. And I think that it can be very challenging, especially because often, women want to spend more time with their kids. They may be less inclined to say, okay, my, I'm, I'm spending quality time with my kids because I'm writing an article while they play under my chair. So it is something to, to think about. And, you know, I just, I have two kids. I'm still an associate professor. And I think that's part of the reason why, but I love my job. And I don't really, I haven't felt like it's really necessary to kill myself to be promoted to full professor. Um, because the amount of publication time I would have had to spend on publication during a critical time with my kids, I would have had to spend too much time away from them. Now, that said, you, you can get a PhD and you don't necessarily have to go to an R1 super aggressively focused on promotion and publication university like USC. There are lots of great academic jobs 
where you can have a PhD, you can have a better, you know, have a great teaching job, you can have a better life balance and you're not being asked to be as productive as you need to be to rise through the ranks at a University of Southern California or a Harvard, Chicago. I mean, there are these like top tier research universities that have very high research productivity expectations. Yeah. Um, so I guess my mm. recommendation is go for it as a woman particularly, but then rec you know understand that once you have a family and you decide to ste step it back a bit, you know, you may have to make some sacrifices. Yeah, I think that probably applies in a lot of different type of positions, certainly in the law field as well. That comes into play. All right, we are up against the hour, but Sarah's been very patient. So I'm gonna let her have the last question of uh, the night. So Sarah, fire away. Thank you. Um, so I had a really quick question. So um, I know right now I'm currently a progressive degree student uh, getting my MPA and a lot of my peers actually are interested in getting their JD degree or their PhD and a lot of the uh, conversations that we have is you know should we start working have experience or should we go right away and I know Ty you mentioned that you worked and then you applied I'm not sure if all of you guys worked and then applied to schools I just wanted to see what were your takes on that because I think a lot of students have been questioning that, especially in the midst of the pandemic and whatnot. Great. Uh, Ty, do you want to comment on that for a sec? Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly comment on that. Um, so I took six years off um, gallivanting the world, you know, <laughs> doing work abroad and everything. And I, I'm glad I did because it really gave me a different perspective and it really shaped my path. Uh, I think if I hadn't done that six years off, I would have been in a different place uh, in terms of like my career and so on. Um, it really depends on your situation. Not everyone is fortunate enough to go directly into school because of the financial costs. Some people need to go and make money to make a living, do whatever they need. So consider what your needs are, consider what sacrifices you can uh, make. And I think it really depends, but look, you know, if it, if you're a current USC student, apply to the USC programs, it won't cost anything. And if you get into the program, make that decision then. Um, and then decide whether or not work or school is the path for you. Great. Well, what a wonderful conversation. Um, I just wanna thank both our faculty members, both of our graduate students, everyone who participated and uh, was in on the panel tonight. I think there was a lot of value in having this panel and I could see us running it again because there's certainly a lot of interest in the world of graduate school. I wanna thank you all and students, just be mindful of your deadlines. Make sure to get everything in and let's all finish out the semester strong. Thank you all again. Oh, I do Will have one, one request. I know, Nicole, you thought <laughs> I was gonna forget, but I didn't. Uh, Nicole's going to take a quick screenshot with everybody, so I'll turn it over to her, and then we can call a night. Thank you. So if everyone just put up a fight on and smile. I'm going to just take a few. Ready? One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you all, and thanks to the panelists again. I appreciate it.